What's up in War Eagle War Report family? You got Ike Jones and we are back with another morning drop today. ESPN has released their two early top 25 rankings for the 2020 fo 2024 football season. And we're going to talk about it. Y'all know how we do right here. War Report style. Let's drop it on them. You are you now, are now listening, listening, to listening to the War the Report. War Report. Morning drop. It is Wednesday, February 24th. So happy Valentine's Day and appropriately happy hump day, right? To everybody out there on a Wednesday, um, Valentine's Day. Hopefully everyone is having a good day. Uh, got some Auburn basketball today. Got a little war report today. Valentine's Day. A lot of things going on today, man. That make your day wonderful. So hopefully you're having a good day so far. Um going to talk a little college football today. ESPN releasing their top 25 rankings for the 2024 season. Their two early top 25 rankings. Um, and, of course, Auburn's not on there, right? So we're not here to announce that ESPN has uh, put some sort of crazy juju out there that says Auburn is going to be a top 25 team to start the, the the season next year. But we definitely want to discuss it before we get into the conversation. Make sure that you are sharing the content. Yes, up front asking for the shares of the content and a like of the content and a subscription to the channel if you don't mind. It's okay. And uh, we'll talk some good college football stuff for you guys today. Um, Again, Auburn not in the top 25, uh, but quite a few teams in the SEC are in that top 25. In fact, um, the Southeastern Conference has 10 of the top 25 teams, according to ESPN, going into the college football season. And the question that I really have for Auburn fans is, what does Auburn need to do to get back to the place where they are in cons consideration for top 25 preseason stuff, even though the preseason polls don't matter. I get it. Like, I am big on we are way too fascinated with polls before people play in a single game. In fact, ESPN put out their too early top 25 uh, a, long, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and then a bunch of coaching changes happened, namely Nick Saban and Jim Harbaugh. And, uh, you know, there's just upheaval around a lot of places in college football. They had to come back and alter it and say, hey, OK, I know, I know we said, you know, this team was going to be blah, blah, blah. But this changes everything. Let's go. out. So, yeah, th this stuff is going to change a lot between now and when college football season starts. And once they played one or two games, they're going to go in and be like, hey, we were completely wrong about this stuff. The problem is that there are a lot of teams that well, not a lot, but there are going to be teams next season that start way outside of the top 25 and then won't have an opportunity to really get into the top 25 or get into consideration for the college football playoff, even with the expansion of 12 because of where they started the season in their projection, unless they have a lot of teams that are in that top 25 to begin the season in the AP poll on their schedule and they end up beating those teams. So you kind of put at a deficit. That's one of the reasons why, Listen, I'm not advocating uh, the expansion up to the 12 team playoff, I think, made a lot of sense for a lot of the reasons that I just outlined. And I'm not advocating for an NCAA bracket, you know, of 68 now field of 68 thing for football, because there's just no way that you can play that many football games in the amount of times and the amount of time necessary to make that make sense. But uh, what I am saying is I do like that in college basketball you have the opportunity for those teams that you hadn't thought about get a chance at least to play late into the season and, you know, go on a Cinderella run and potentially do some things. You know, the, the butlers of the world come to mind that you, you never would see a butler style school in the college football national championship. The closest we got to that was Cincinnati, uh, excuse me, tech, uh, Texas, uh, well to Cincinnati in the playoff. And then, um, 
what was it, TCU in the college football championship uh, that one season. Closest you're going to get is something like that, I suppose. Uh, but again, with the 12-team playoff, maybe you'll get an opportunity for that. But anyway, I'm going on a rant right now or a sidebar. This has nothing to do with what I intended to talk about. What I did want to talk about is the SEC domination. And here are the teams that are in that two early top 25 from the Southeastern Conference. Of course, Georgia is number one perennially. Now they are going to be up there in the top because of a couple of things, right? They have recruited well. Uh, they have the what most people would t term the best c college football coach currently coaching, right? Like Kirby Smart is that guy. Uh, you know, I would have argued he was the guy before Nick Saban retired just because I think that he had he earned the right to be in the conversation to, for being the best current college football coach with the w direction that he's taken that program at Georgia. Uh, but they are number one. They've got uh, – a bunch of really good players coming back for that team, and then they've recruited really well to restock the cupboard. Um, then you've got now newly into the SEC, Texas, who's at number four in that too early ranking. And Texas was in the college football playoff last year. They're still going to have their starting quarterback coming back. They've got a fierce defense. They've got Steve Sarkeesian, who is one of the better football minds, specifically offensively around the country right now. Um, and in the era of NIL, you can't count out Texas teams for being able to restock the cupboard. They've done well in the transfer portal. Texas is going to be formidable. Uh, next, you've got Ole Miss, which, you know, listen, for as much as I make fun of Ole Miss and their, uh, you know, broken, ugly status, they have a good football program right now. You know, Lane Kiffin is a good college football mind as far as his ability to cre recruit um, in the transfer portal and for his ability to call offensive plays. Um, they are getting better defensively every season. Ole Miss is a team that deserves to be up here in consideration and likely on the precipice of making the college football playoff in this new expanded field of 12 if they can continue in the direction that they're going. Uh, and a, a team that's made a meteoric rise right now at number seven on that list is Missouri. Uh, this Missouri team is doing work out here uh, as far as high school recruiting is concerned. And, uh, you know, their coach in uh, Eliah Drinkwitz has done a great program, uh, done a good job of building that program incrementally over the seasons uh, from when he first got there from a kind of a, a program who had had some proud traditions coming from the Big 12, uh, early days in the SEC, making the SEC championship game back-to-back -back seasons, but then kind of bottomed out, and now they're making their ascent back to a place where they're a program of respectability. Number seven, a good spot for them. Um, you know, I'm not here to talk about who deserves to be where, any of that stuff. Again, it's too early to really be doing this, just evaluating what is. Um, then you have Alabama, who uh, has fallen back in some people's minds because of the retirement of Nick Saban. Uh, Kalen DeBoer, though, he coached a Washington team that was in the national, in the college football playoff and the uh, national championship game. Uh, has a lot of work to do in people's minds as far as cementing whether or not he can continue the legacy left by the greatest college football coach to ever grace the sideline, in my opinion, in Nick Saban. Um, you know, and it's difficult when you're following in the steps or in the shadow of uh, a guy who was as prominent in college football as Nick Saban to be the guy after that. A lot of work for Kalen DeBoer, but Alabama's still in the top 10, according to ESPN. Uh, next up, you've got LSU, a program who has been up and down, but still uh, managed to get a lot of wins last season, despite people feeling as if they weren't as dominant as they probably could have been off to a rocky start with the early loss to Florida State last season, um, had the, the Heisman uh, quarterback there last year and Jaden Daniels, who will no longer be with the program. So they've got some questions they have to answer about how they're going to continue to be as good offensively, considering how poor they were defensively last year. You lose your best player on the team as far as quarterback position. Can you continue to produce those results? Again, recruiting's not going to be a problem uh, down there in Baton Rouge. So LSU still within the top 15 coming in at top at, at number 12. Uh, another SEC newcomer in Oklahoma there at number 14. This is another program that traditionally has been really good. Um, probably this recruiting or excuse me, this ranking is more to do with the name than it has to do with what they've produced. Now, they are a team that has been 9, 10 wins perennially. They do have a, a solid program and a coach that's been able to keep them in respectability there in the Big 12. Uh, but they've got a lot of questions that they have to answer. They have a new starting quarterback there, um, but they are currently ranked at 14, according to ESPN. 
Tennessee comes in at number 16, another team that's got a lot of questions that they have to answer, but they have a coach that, again, is a good offensive mind that's kept them in the the spot where uh, people respect their ability to go out there and put points up. They struggled a little bit at times last year to be able to do that. Their defense held them into some games. It's going to be interesting to see how Tennessee turns the corner uh, with a new quarterback um, that I think may be a little bit better fit for them. They're, you know, in a little hot water um, in terms of what's going on with their program. But I don't know if any, you know, I don't know if the NCAA still has any teeth left to be able to enforce anything. So we'll see what actually happens with Tennessee. But they come in ranked at number 16 in the ESPN two early poll. Kentucky at number 23. This is another program that has made a lot of strides. Um, you know, the, uh, Mark Stoops has gotten Kentucky from a place of being kind of a lagging, laughing stock in college football to a place where people have to respect the fact that Kentucky's on their schedule. They're going to be a tough defensive team under him. Uh, they have a an offense that is up and down, but, you know, they have been formidable being able to get to, you know, eight, nine wins perennially now under uh, uh, Stoops. So we'll see where they finish the season, but currently ranked at number 23. And then uh, bringing up the rear in the top 25 is Texas A&M at number 25. Uh, you know, a lot of faith in a program that has been really mediocre the last couple of seasons, but they finished decently last year despite uh, some rocky starts. To, you know, they, they actually they started pretty well, then they had a dip in the middle of the season, but finished pr- decently. I think they're putting a lot of stock in the, the new uh, head football coach there as to whether or not he and his second stint at Texas A&M is going to be able to bring that program back up to prominence again. Texas school not going to have a problem recruiting ton of talent there. Uh, they had a little bit of upheaval in the transfer portal during the offseason. So looking to stabilize that program right now, but they are ranked in the top 25. Again, just running that down for you. Um, but Again, the question that I have for uh, Auburn fans is what is it going to take to get Auburn back into a place where they can climb into being in this conversation again in the preseason? In the preseason, not that it matters ultimately where you start. It matters where you finish. I understand all of that. I advocate for it. It doesn't matter where you start. It's where you finish. But let's be clear. Where you start does help you to get to the finish line a little bit better. If you start at a higher spot, then they're more reluctant to drop you unless you have an inexplicable loss early um, and you can recover well if you start early with a high ranking. Can't Auburn get this program back into a place where at the beginning of the season, we're talking about an Auburn program that people are saying, hey, they deserve to be in the top 25 consideration early or they're just outside of it. And, you know, they've got an opportunity to play their way into it. Uh, What things does Auburn need to do in this season so that when 2025 comes back around, we're having this conversation very differently? Auburn sets itself up uh, appropriately to be able to do that because if you look at those teams that are in the top 25, a lot of them are on Auburn's schedule. So Auburn's got a chance to prove it on the field why they belong in there. Georgia, Missouri, Alabama, Oklahoma, Kentucky, and Texas A&M all in the two early top 25, all of them on Auburn's schedule for next season. So when you look at it on the face, you say to yourself, ah, man, Auburn's got a pretty light schedule. Then you go back and you reevaluate where some of these programs that traditionally have not been respectable across the college football landscape, and you see teams like Georgia, and you see teams like Kentucky, excuse me, not Georgia, you see teams like Missouri, and you see teams like Kentucky, in that conversation now. So Auburn has to face quite a few teams that are going to be in that conversation uh, for the college football playoff, for the SEC championship talk. All of those things are going to be on the table for all of the teams that are now on Auburn's schedule. And so Auburn has a lot of work that it has to do in order to get to a place where, hey, we're in this conversation. In fact, Auburn is the only team, and this kind of proves the direction that Coach Hugh Freeze is taking the program, and I believe to be the correct direction. Auburn's the only team that is currently ranked for this season in the top 10 in recruiting classes that fell outside of the top 25 in this too early um, top 25 for ESPN. It's the only team that's not 
that was in the top 10, but is not in the top 25 as far as the program rankings are concerned. So Auburn making a stride in the correct direction as far as bringing in talent for this freshman class. Auburn's got a lot of work that they have to do to make sure that when next season rolls around, they're in the top 10 again, but now they're in the top 25 conversation. In fact, I think that Auburn needs to finish inside of the top 25 next season in order for this to be a thing. You need to go out here. You need to, of the one, two, three, four, five, six teams that are ranked in this too early top 25, I think you need to split those games somehow next season in order to get yourself into that conversation next season. But I want to hear what you all think needs to happen for this next season coming up for Auburn football in order to change the narrative around where Auburn is for the next coming for this upcoming season. All right, that's enough of me talking. I want to hear your thoughts. We're going to get into those. It's Valentine's Day, so of course we got to talk about our folks at Manscaped. Listen, if you haven't already handled your business with Manscaped and gotten that out of the way, don't worry. I know Valentine's Day is today, but go ahead and place your order today so that you can make sure the next special occasion that you have, you get yourself right. Because it's in full swing here. You know, New Year's resolutions around Manscaped's got to get you right for this coming year and make sure that you're groomed properly properly below the waist. So introducing the MVP of 2024 Manscaped's fifth generation lawnmower. It's not just a trimmer. It's your grooming sidekick equipped with two skin safe blade heads, a standard one for taking a little bit off the top and a new, excuse me, foil blade to go smooth wherever wherever your heart decide, desires. It's like having a personal stylus at your fingertips or, well, wherever you need it. Uh, and did we mention it's waterproof because a trim in the shower is the only way to start the day. Get 20% off and free shipping with code rapport at Manscaped. Embrace a new you and definitely embrace a new trimmer courtesy of Manscaped. So when you go there, use code rapport that lets them know that you guys at the war rapport sent you. All right. Let's get over into this comment section because the Green Name Gang always has great things to say. And I want to hear what you all are talking about this morning on a Valentine's Day. Daniel Moultrie says, happy Valentine's Day, fam. Appreciate you uh, giving a great shout out to the War Poor and Auburn family who are watching this show um, on Valentine's Day. Auburn dad jumps in with a happy Valentine's Day as well. Appreciate you being in here. Daniel Moultrie comes back and says, hot take for the season. Bama doesn't finish in the top 25. That would be that's a that's a pretty hot take. It's a pretty hot take. I don't know if I agree with that. I think there's still a ton of talent on that Bama team. And because, you know, as I said earlier, because they started so high, I think that Bama's got to lose four games to fall outside of the top 25. I haven't looked at their schedule. And again, it's a little too early for me to make predictions on people's schedules. But I think that that's probably be what Bama would have to do is lose four games to be outside of that. So um, I don't know. We'll see. Jonathan Boyson jumps in and says, you need to win more than six games. I understand completely why we aren't ranked right now. If we beat New Mexico State and Bama like we should have, we might have been on the fringe. I agree with literally every syllable of this. If Auburn had beaten New Mexico State and Bama like they should have last season, then you finish that season with eight regular season wins. Um, and even with a bowl loss, which I don't know that you even lose the bowl game, if you go into the bowl game with that kind of momentum, and plus you wouldn't have been playing Maryland, you've been playing some other team, and I don't think it was more so about the Maryland matchup. I think it was about kind of the spirits of where the team finished uh, that had that bowl looking so crazy. Um, but I agree that you'd be in the conversation had you handled those last two games of the season the way that you should have Um and you, you'd be in a different position as far as in the conversation. You're right. Auburn hasn't done enough to earn being in the top 25 conversation. Auburn dad saying laughing out loud, broken, ugly, doesn't deserve top 10. Hey, listen here. I'm not saying who deserves what, just saying what happened. Um, I think that, you know, the Ole Miss program has done a lot of great things. I think a lot of what they've done in the transfer portal in the offseason and um, kind of what they've done over the last couple of years is what's garnered this respect for the Ole Miss program. And hey, listen. I'm just uh, here to, to re again, report what happened, and I'm hoping that Auburn gets into a place where people are talking about them being overrated and you're coming in and having to prove what your rating is and the, and, and the fact that maybe, hey, you're, you're not rated highly enough. We need to get to that place. Uh, Daniel Moultrie says them losing Judkins and Derek Nix will hurt. Um, I mean, I think that ultimately that there is going to be some – I mean, listen, you can't lose a player like uh, – 
quit Sean Judkins and, and pretend as if that's of no effect on your team. Uh, because of the way that they were running back by committee a little bit more last year as opposed to uh, Judkins or Buss, um, unlike the previous year in 2022. I think that they'll be okay with Ulysses Bentley coming back, and and hopefully they'll, you know, not hopefully because I, I mean, they're not on my schedule. They can be as successful as they want to be. Uh, but they'll find a second back to be able to continue to, to keep your backs fresh and have a one-two punch there. And, uh, you know, Lane Kiffin is good at being able to scheme a good run game. So, I think they'll be okay as far as their run game's concerned. Now, how that will play dividends going forward in the future without Derek Nix, I don't know. Uh, I have no idea who they hired in his stead. I don't pay enough attention to Ole Miss to even know or care about that. Uh, Jonathan Boyson jumps back in. I think uh, Oklahoma, OU, is overrated. Not sure about Kentucky and a and Honestly, the rest I can see. Maybe a question about LSU, but they're always loaded with talent. Didn't go into the full list, but just because we're talking about it, full list, uh, not including SEC, not just SEC teams. Of course, Georgia number one, Ohio State at number two, Oregon at number three, Texas at number four, Notre Dame at number five, uh, Ole Miss at six, uh, Missouri at seven, Penn State at eight. Uh, Alabama at 9, Utah comes in at 10, Arizona at 11, LSU at 12, Michigan at 13, uh, Oklahoma 14, Florida State at 15, Tennessee 16, Oklahoma State at 17, North Carolina State, NC State at 18, Clemson at 19, Kansas State at 20, Louisville at 21, uh, Kansas at 22, that Kansas program has done a lot to be in a pr- too early top 25. Kentucky at 23, Miami, okay, at 24, and Texas A&M at 25. Uh, listen, I, I, I'm not, if, if any, t- the only team that's head scratching on that one for me is Miami. Listen, Miami fans, if you're watching, which I doubt it, I don't know, fam. I, uh, I, I don't know that Miami did enough to be there, but I, I don't know what team I put over them. So listen, I'll let the people who do the rankings and the ratings sort out who deserves to be there. But all right. Uh, let's see. Daniel Moultrie says Mizzou is a great example of the benefits of giving the coach you hire time to build their program and do their thing. Uh, absolutely. I believe this. I also believe that what choice did Missouri have? Like there wasn't like it's not like Missouri's program. Again, though they had been good in the Big 12, they've never been this perennial powerhouse team where uh, you expect them to be in the top 25 and coaches you know when they leave they're going to be paid handsomely to get a new guy in like Missouri just they Missouri and Kentucky are examples of hey be patient with your coach and they will build a program that you can be respected with but ultimately they kind of have a cap on where they can go um, with a lot of this stuff but you know listen Arkansas is the example of the exact opposite you give a coach a bunch of time and Maybe it doesn't work out for you, right? And I don't think programs who have been traditionally powerhouses have the luxury of time and and and, and waiting. Now, I think two and three year rotation of, of coaches is a little is a little much unless you have a surefire next to guy that's going to be the guy. Which is why I think the, you know the year three hot seat talk for Hugh Freeze is a little premature. Right. Year two hot seat talk is crazy, but year three hot seat talk is premature. But I think the reality of where Auburn is as far as in the the uh, the the history of collegiate football, year three is right around where those conversations start happening. And when you look at the way that Coach Hugh Freeze's contract is structured, that's when those conversations are naturally going to begin to happen. So um, I do advocate for giving time for a coach. You know, I think four years is really a right around where you want to see a leap in your program. But year three, I think, is going to be the year that's going to be that pivot point for Coach Hugh Freeze as to whether or not this program is going in the right direction on the field. The recruiting doing a great job, but in the era of the transfer portal, if on the field results haven't gotten to where they need to be by year the three, and I'm talking about nine, ten wins, that's when that conversation is going to start to become very crazy, very crazy. Jared Reynolds asks, how does A&M get love every season? New coach lost 26 players to the portal with 15 in 2023 class rankings. Math ain't mathin'. Listen, they have a lot of, uh, of, of confidence in the ability of their coach to get them back into the place where they want them to be. Um, I don't know. Listen, it's a Texas team. 
They're going to have a ton of talent on that team, regardless of how much talent left. They got a lot of talent back in the transfer portal. Um, And, you know, top 25, it is what it is. It is what it is. I'm not mad at it. I just, I, again, I want to be back in the conversation as an Auburn fan where people are saying, how is Auburn ranked that high? I, 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 that's what I want to be, and that's what I want to see is how does Auburn get back into, why are they ranked so high? They only won eight games last year. How are they in the top 25 this year? That's When we come back next year, this is the conversation that I want people to be having all across the, the sphere of college football. Chris S. says, let's beat four of those five on our schedule. We need to do it. We need to do it. Jonathan Boyson jumps back in and says, that tells me, Ike, that they don't think that our roster has the talent like TK says, uh, said the eggs we had, the eggs we laid last year. Yeah, I mean, listen, um, I, I don't know that it's indicative of what they feel like the talent is on our roster more so than how little we've proved on the field, right? Like we can, let's go back and talk about Texas A&M, right? Like, yeah, Texas A&M had a lot of change this off season, but they still won like eight games last year, right? They still had a respectable win loss record last season. And they didn't hire some bum of a coach, right? They hired a good coach, quality coach. So, you know, despite a lot of changes, right? Look at, Bama, right? Bama had a ton of attrition in the transfer portal, but they still hired a quality coach and they still had a lot of talent left on that team. And they still have a, um, had a, had a good season last year, right? They made it to, uh, the college football playoff last year. So a, a lot of it has to do with that. And, and again, I think where you start determines, you know, the results don't make you fall as far after you start high. We started from so far back and then didn't do much to change people's opinions with the play on the field last year. The offense was so poor last year. And I'll say this, I think it has a lot to do with a lack of confidence in what this offense is going to do, specifically the fact that we haven't made any monumental changes at the quarterback position. If you go in and you get a quarterback, this is no disrespect to any of the quarterbacks that are on the team. They haven't proved anything on the field yet. When you don't have a quarterback that's proven anything on the field and you don't have a guy who people just naturally assume, right, like an Arch Manning, for instance, that they are going to come in and be great just because of who they are, right? I think a lot of people think that Walker White is the the incumbent heir apparent at Auburn, but very few people think that he's going to be a day one starter and subsequently a difference maker on the field for Auburn this season. If you have a monumental change like that where you get if they if Auburn had landed one of the marquee transfer quarterbacks that were in the transfer portal last year, I guarantee you Auburn would at least be in consideration automatically this season because people would have a ton of hope that this offense was going to be revitalized in year two of Coach Hugh Freeze and him and his play calling, and you got a top 10 uh, recruiting class coming in and all of this talent. I guarantee you that narrative would have changed if the quarterback position had had some monumental change as well. I prompt that because that's just the way that people think about college football. So Auburn hasn't proved anything um, other than that that Coach Hugh Freeze can recruit right now. So there's a lot that needs to happen for Auburn to get into that space. Uh, Daniel Moultrie jumps back in and says eight to nine wins with a bowl victory and visible improvement in the passing game will show them we're on the right track. I agree with all of these things. I agree with all of these things. Jonathan Boyson, passing game improvement. Don't lay an egg and beat the teams you should win a couple will be underdogs uh, and win a couple we will be underdogs eight wins should be the minimum in my opinion I think eight I think eight wins is the number I think if you get to eight wins this season like you said you, you beat somebody who you're not quote unquote supposed to beat then you'll be in a position to be in that conversation next year Chris S thinks that six games are gimmies this year uh, when you look at the Auburn schedule I think every year you can pretty much say four to five of those wins Auburn shouldn't struggle in those games, right? They, they should just go out there and beat them. But and he lays out the ones that he thinks New Mexico State. Well, well we'd play New Mexico, not New Mexico State. So New Mexico, A uh, and M, U L M, Vandy, Arky, and Cal are the games that he thinks no doubt Auburn should win this season. I can't be mad at that list. 
But again, Auburn's got some stuff that they've got to prove because literally every other, all the other six games are games where I, if, if I don't think Vegas has odds out on the games that early, but I, I bet you if you looked at futures coming into the season on every game except for those six, Auburn would not be favored in any of them. I'd, I'd venture to say that. So uh, we'll see where it comes to by the time we start actually playing football, but there's a lot Auburn's got to prove. Uh, Chris S. echoing what I said earlier, Missouri plays with house money. They have zero pressure or expectations. I do think that the expectations coming into this season are going to be a little bit different for Missouri. Again, if they start getting top 15 preseason poll rankings, um, the expectations are going to start to change over there in Columbia, and they're going to have to start winning not eight, nine games perennially, or that drink with seat is going to start to get hot. They're going to start to say, hey, he got us to – a place of respectability, but is he the guy to take us to the next step? Um, and so, you know, expectations start to change. Just like, listen, think about Auburn basketball and and how the expectations expectations have changed for Auburn basketball. Six years ago, nobody is sitting here having a come apart at an Auburn team that's you know sitting here with four losses in conference. They're not. They're just like, oh man, Auburn's doing good this year, <laughs> right? Like, you you're you're in a place now where the expect expectations have drastically changed for Auburn basketball. I think that that's starting to become the case. Let let Drinkwitz and, and company reproduce last season in the win loss column. That next year, you're going to start to come in with different expectations for what you're going to see, especially if they continue to do well in recruiting. Especially if they continue to do well in recruiting. Uh, Miller House says that he is glad, so glad Philip Montgomery isn't calling plays this year. Random shot at uh, Philip Montgomery there from Miller. Um, listen, man, um, I just think it just the, the marriage wasn't right. We've talked about that many times, um, but we, we'll see. I think Coach Freeze, I, I, I like the fact that he's taking over play calling duties because, listen, it's going to be on him now, and we need to make sure that this program has uni unity and vision so that the, that there's no mistake about what direction we're attempting to go and who's calling the shots in that direction. So we'll see what happens. All right. This is a great conversation, but uh, I got to get out of here. You guys have been wonderful this morning. Uh, make sure that you continue to support the sponsors of the War Report, Manscaped.com, using code Rapport. And the sponsor of every morning drop, which is the Rogue Shop, RogueShop.com, using code Rapport. You get a little something off your purchase at America's number one online dispensary. Sleep, stress, anxiety, pain relief, all of those available for you right there at the Rogue Shop. Make sure you tell them the War Report sent you by using the code. Like the video before you get out of here. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Share the content with somebody else. We'll be back at you guys with a Lobtown previewing today's matchup between top 10, 20 excuse me teams in South Carolina and Auburn uh, in Neville Arena tonight and then we will be back at you all tomorrow no midweek report tonight because of the basketball game tomorrow with the midweek report uh, but until then and as always War Eagle